When it comes to using chemicals, what you don't know can hurt you, badly. After all, it's not only your livelihood, but your life. So you need to know about the potential chemical hazards that can affect you and your co-workers' health and safety. That's why the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, or OSHA, developed the Hazard Communication Standard. You may have also heard it referred to as the Right to Know Act, which is a regulation of the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA. This program will help you learn about the hazardous chemicals you may be exposed to on the job and the steps you and your employer can take for your safety and protection. There are two ways a chemical can be hazardous. It can be a physical hazard if it has the potential to cause a dangerous situation like a fire or an explosion. And it can be a health hazard if it has the potential to damage your health. Or it can be both. A chemical can damage your health when you inhale it, ingest it, or absorb it through your skin or eyes. Acute health hazards like poisoning and chemical burns do their damage rapidly as the result of short-term exposure. Chronic health hazards affect the body slowly through long-term exposure. Chronic health problems such as cancer and heart damage have been linked to particular chemicals. Almost everyone in a hospital has the possibility of working with hazardous chemicals. Let's start with the nursing unit. Here, certain drugs can be especially hazardous, like the powerful chemotherapy drugs given to fight cancer. Accidental exposure to these drugs can actually cause cancer and other serious health problems to nurses and pharmacists who mix them, and to the housekeeping staff who clean up spills and remove waste. Accidental exposure is even possible in busy emergency rooms while treating industrial workers involved in accidents. And don't think chemicals are only liquids in containers. Your hazard communications program covers chemicals in all physical forms, liquids, solids, gases, vapors, fumes, and mists. If it's a hazard and you can be exposed to it, it's covered. Take anesthetic gases. Exposure may cause headaches, nausea, decreased mental alertness, and reduced motor coordination, and may contribute to birth defects, miscarriages, and cancer in operating and recovery room staff. Or ethylene oxide an exceptionally hazardous gas used to sterilize hospital equipment. If not used properly, it can damage the skin, respiratory system, and the nervous system, and it may possibly cause sterility, birth defects, and cancer. And plain old oxygen used in operating and recovery rooms and contained in pipes throughout some hospitals is dangerous because it makes other materials highly flammable. And what about this cleansing agent? Is it hazardous? You bet. Products like disinfectants and grease cutters seem harmless enough, but they're solvents. This means they help dissolve other substances. And if you're not careful, your skin and eyes can be damaged. As we've already seen, some chemicals commonly used in healthcare facilities today may cause possible reproductive damage. These chemicals include ethylene oxide, fluorinated hydrocarbons, anti-cancer drugs, mercury, 
nitrous oxide, formaldehyde, and various ingredients in cleaning solutions. Also, polychlorinated biphenyls, PCBs, which may be present in the transformers of some older facilities, have been linked with reproductive damage. Knowing the hazards you're working with is an important first step in protecting yourself. That's why you should get to know your employer's written hazard communication program. It's your guide to finding out about working safely with chemicals. The program lists all the hazardous chemicals present in your facility, including those in unlabeled pipes. It also contains information about how your employer will provide warning labels, material safety data sheets, and information and training for employees who work with hazardous chemicals on a routine basis. It also tells you who is responsible for seeing that the program is carried out in your facility. By law, every chemical that is shipped into your facility must have a warning label attached to it by its manufacturer. A warning label is your first line of information. It lists a variety of vital information and must include the product's chemical name, any hazardous ingredients, hazard warning, and the chemical manufacturer's name and address. The hazard warning must include target organ effects. So if when inhaled, the chemical causes lung damage, then that is the appropriate warning. Lung damage is the hazard, not inhalation. If you notice any hazardous chemicals with warning labels that are damaged, incomplete, or missing, report them to your supervisor. Your employer is responsible for seeing that they are replaced. And if a chemical is transferred to another container, your employer must see to it that the new container is also labeled. However, there are a few exceptions. For example, if a number of stationary containers in an area hold chemicals with similar hazards, your employer can post warning signs rather than labeling each container. And since pipes are not considered containers, they do not have to be labeled. Another exception. When you transfer a chemical from a labeled container to a portable one, the portable container does not have to be labeled if you plan to use the chemical immediately. But be sure you never leave an unmarked container of a hazardous chemical unattended. And if you find an unlabeled container, don't assume the contents are harmless just because there is no label. In fact, some healthcare facilities require all containers to be labeled, even if they contain water. Other labeling information you may find in your facility is the National Fire Protection Association, NFPA, symbol and numbering system. This symbol shows the chemical's various hazards. The yellow diamond informs you of the chemical's reactivity. Blue indicates if it's a serious health hazard. And the red shows the chemical's flammability. The higher the number from zero to four, the greater the hazard. Also look in the white diamond for the chemical's specific hazard. For example, OX means it's an oxidizer. For more detailed information than the warning label gives, you can turn to the chemical's material safety data sheet, or MSDS. Chemical suppliers must provide an MSDS on every hazardous chemical they ship into your workplace. Your employer then makes sure that the MSDS for every chemical you work with is available to you. MSDSs may be kept in a binder, a file cabinet, or on a computer terminal, as long as you can gain access to them in your work area during working hours. The MSDS you work with comes in a variety of lengths and formats. They all contain basically the same vital information, but it may be organized in various ways. It's always a good practice to be familiar with the MSDS for any chemical you work with before a problem arises. That way, you are prepared to react to an emergency. First of all, the MSDS gives you the name of the chemical, the same name that is on the product's container. It also lists the name, address, and phone number of the manufacturer in case you have general questions about the chemical 
as well as a phone number to call in an emergency. If you have two MSDSs for the same chemical, use the one with the most complete information. Also check the date the MSDS was last revised. This tells you how up to date the MSDS is. The MSDS must identify the substance by its chemical name and any common names. This is usually done in the first section of the form. For instance, formaldehyde, which is used in hospital labs to preserve surgical specimens, is also listed as formalin on its MSDS. If the chemical's identity is a trade secret, the manufacturer can withhold this information. But the manufacturer must still provide full information on the chemical's hazards and how to control them. A second section lists hazardous ingredients of the chemical that can harm you. It also gives the concentration of the chemical to which you can be safely exposed. Look for key terms like permissible exposure limits, PELs, or threshold limit value, TLVs, the maximum concentrations of the substance that most are allowed to be exposed to averaged over an eight-hour work shift. A third section describes physical data that can help you identify the chemical, such as its appearance and odor, as well as other characteristics like boiling point, melting point, vapor pressure, vapor density, solubility in water, and evaporation rate. For example, formaldehyde is described on the MSDS as a clear, colorless liquid with a pungent odor, while chloroform, another lab chemical, is described as a clear, colorless, volatile liquid with a sweet, pleasant odor. A fourth section informs you of any severe immediate hazards, such as when the chemical might ignite or explode. Look for the flash point, or temperature at which the chemical ignites. For flammables, this is below 100 degrees Fahrenheit. For combustibles, the flash point is 100 degrees Fahrenheit or above. Here you'll also find out what to put on the fire to extinguish it safely. Another section lists health hazards caused by the chemical, including the symptoms of overexposure and medical conditions that may be aggravated by exposure. For adriamycin, an anti-cancer drug, the MSDS states that acute overexposure can cause eye, skin, and respiratory irritation, while chronic exposure can also cause changes in skin pigmentation. In addition, adriamycin itself can cause cancer, and it may aggravate pre-existing medical conditions, such as cardiovascular, liver, or kidney disease, and bone marrow impairment. This section also gives first aid and emergency procedures. For example, Adriamycin's MSDS recommends washing with soap and water immediately if it comes in contact with your skin. A section on reactivity informs you of whether the chemical is stable or unstable, conditions to avoid, as well as its incompatibility with other materials. Another section tells how to clean up accidental spills or leaks and may tell how to dispose of the chemical. For example, to clean a spill of ethylene oxide, the MSDS says to wear a self-contained breathing apparatus and full protective clothing. In many instances, commercially packaged emergency response kits are available to clean up spills of blood and other hazardous substances, including some chemicals. It's always a good idea to notify your supervisor of any chemical spill right away. And make sure you're trained and wearing the appropriate protective gear before you attempt to clean it up. The section on special protection lists any personal protective equipment you'll need to work safely with the chemical, such as a flow hood, respirator mask, splash goggles, latex gloves, and a long-sleeved impermeable disposable gown you'll need if you work with adriamycin, according to its MSDS. Full protective gear, as well as an air-supplied positive pressure respirator, are also MSDS recommendations when you must change bottles of ethylene oxide. And even common cleaning products can require you to use personal protective equipment. For example, this chemical cleans and disinfects hospital shower stalls, making the environment safe for patients. But when you follow the MSDS by wearing gloves and goggles, you help keep yourself safe as well. 
A final section lists additional special precautions to follow when handling the chemical. This may include what you should have on hand to clean up a spill or extinguish a fire, as well as other health and safety information. Another important source of information on hazardous chemicals is your employer's training program. This includes helping you understand your facility's written hazard communication program and how to read and use the various labels and MSDSs. You'll also learn about the specific hazards you face from chemicals you're exposed to on the job, even if the exposure is accidental. To ensure a safe work environment, you'll be trained before actually working with the chemicals. And if the chemical you currently work with is replaced by a chemical with similar hazards, you will not be retrained. You will learn about the steps your employer has taken to protect you and how you can protect yourself with the use of personal protective equipment and safe work practices. You will also learn how to detect the presence of hazardous chemicals by their appearance, smell or other characteristics. And finally, should the unexpected happen, you will be trained in various emergency procedures. Now you understand that you need to know about the chemicals you work with and that the warning labels, MSDSs, and your facility's written hazard communication program are important, vital keys to safety. All this information is your right to know, but it's no good unless you exercise that right. Please be sure to read all warning labels and check out the MSDSs. Then use that information by wearing the necessary protective equipment and by following safety procedures carefully. You need to know. Because when it comes to working with chemicals, it's what you know that counts.